say growl. Thrilled to welcome you all 
here today on behalf of the Board of Trustees. And I just wanted to give a shout out to three of my fellow trustees who are in the room, Marsha Mortimer, Sharon Jordan, and uh, Dr. Beck, Bill Levering over here in the corner. We had a special trip in from South Africa. <laughs> exciting time for all of us since Dr. Frank Wicks first approached us about his vision for these statues. I want to thank and congratulate Frank as well as his entire team for this impressive accomplishment. Thanks Frank. In celebrating William Seward and Harriet Tubman, we come together to express our common humanity and our values of inclusion and compassion. And isn't it fitting that this statue leads people to our library, a place where everyone in our community is welcome. I still remember discovering who Harriet Tubman was, the most famous of the Underground Railroad conductors, the Moses of her people. I learned about Harriet Tubman as a young girl as I worked my way, person by person, through the biography section of the children's room of the Watertown, Massachusetts Free Public Library. And I want to emphasize the free part of that sentence because that is why I'm glad that Dr. Wicks decided that our library was the most fitting location for these statues. Freedom, equity, self-sustainability, William Seward understood how those were cornerstones of our democracy, and he understood how slavery worked against those values. Seward and Harriet Tubman took great risks to deliver enslaved men and women to freedom. You know, I learned something, like Jack, I guess, about Harriet Tubman when I read a biography from her from our children's library room. Harriet, known far and wide as a master storyteller, whose courage helped hundreds of runaway slaves escape their chains, never learned to read or write. The irony of that hit home for me because of our core mission as a free public library, access to literacy. It's literacy that opens doors to freedom by unchaining our minds and our imaginations. It opens doors so that our creativity, our empathy for others, and our capacity for learning continues to expand throughout our lives. And that is why the placement of this beautiful sculpture at one of our community's most important entities, its library, is so fitting. Thank you to all of you again. Philip, I don't believe, is here yet. Hopefully, he's working on legislation to cut our county taxes by 50%. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but Angelo Santa Barbara is here. Angelo, why don't you come on up and say a word? Yes, Philip, uh, he's on his way. <coughs> he, uh, <coughs> excuse me. He, uh, he did message us, and he will be here shortly. He apologizes for the delay. Uh, I want to I want to just uh, uh, take a moment to thank everyone in this room, everyone that was involved in this project. Uh, I do have to thank uh, special thanks to Professor Wicks. Uh, he got me involved in this project. He told me what it was all about before uh, it ever materialized. Uh, we have a sort of a history. He was my one of my engineering professors, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's one of the reasons that I actually went on to a successful engineering career. And uh, we've been uh, friends ever since. And now that I. Uh, uh, have been with the office. We still talk about a lot about uh, different things in the community. And this is one of them that we talked about, and uh, he got he got me involved in this. And it was something important to our community. And it's, it's we're celebrating history here today, uh, and it's important that we remember our history. And having this, uh, as Carmel said, having this statue here at the library uh, is so very fitting because libraries are a united force, a place for opportunity, a place for people to come together. And these are the messages that we, we uh, are delivering here, messages that we've seen in the past, and it's very important that we remember them in the present, but also carry them on as we go forward in the future. So as you look at the program, you see that uh, this project didn't happen by accident. There's so many partners, so many people involved in making this happen, and I say this often about the Cementry area. That's what makes our community so special. People want these things to happen. 
Uh, and this wasn't just an idea, it was something that, are, that brought us together. We're all here in this room today, we're celebrating, but you look at the names on here, look at how many people are involved. That really speaks to who we are. And I'm so very pleased uh, to be able to be here and be a part of this very special day. I was saying on the way in, uh, uh, you know, someday we're going to look back at these events, and they happen quite often here in Spanish. We're going to look back at these unveilings and, and these accomplishments, and we're going to say, wow, we were a part of that. We were a part of that history. Uh, and that's something very special uh, for all of us. So thank you for, uh, for including me, and thank you for having me be a part of this. I mean, God bless all of you. God bless you. Safe and abiding belief in equality, 
liberty, and the importance of freedom. This exhibit is a story of parallel lines that meet, and I'll cover Mr. Seward's line today. Uh, it's likely that William Seward met Harriet Tubman, uh, or became increasingly aware of her by the middle and late 1850s, as she's leading many of her dangerous passages from <coughs> slavery to freedom, bringing some uh, 80 persons with her, freedom seekers. Around the same time that Harriet Tubman first self-liberates, the uh, fall of uh, 1849, William Henry Seward is a new senator in Washington, D.C., and setting a new tone in Washington, representing New York and this burned over part of it, alive with the spirit of reform and anti-slavery. But Seward uh, began, actually some of his earliest uh, on-the-record thoughts on slavery began right here in Schenectady when he's a student at Union College giving a commencement address. He, uh, he presages some of his great speeches, the irrepressible conflict, talking about slavery as something that cannot long endure even while slavery is still legal in New York State. As governor of New York from 1839 to 1843, he would strike some blows against the institution, supporting legislation that empowered agencies to investigate claims of wrongful kidnapping of freeborn New Yorkers of color, <coughs> Solomon Northrop, from their freedom into slavery, resisting Southern overtures that he returned enslaved persons who made it to New York's borders in this pre-Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 time. A rising star in the Whig, soon to be a uh, Republican, in the Whig Party in 1848, hoping to become a senator. In Cleveland, he gives a rousing speech. Taking a hard stand, he asks the crowd, can nothing be done for freedom because the public conscience is inert? Yes, much can be done. Everything can be done. Slavery can and must be abolished, and you must do it, and I must do it. For the decade that followed in the 1850s, he continues this line of argument in Washington, even while Harriet Tubman is taking those many dangerous journeys. In 1850, his so-called maiden speech before the Senate floor declares his beliefs in a higher law than the American Constitution. He argues to his colleagues, I am opposed to any compromise in any and all forms which has been proposed because I think all legislative compromises with slavery Radical, wrong, and essentially vicious, hence this higher law. While serving in the U.S. Senate, shocking many colleagues, the radicalism of his rhetoric, at home in Auburn, his wife, Frances Seward, is opening her doors to be a stop on the Underground Railroad, the network to freedom. Mr. Seward himself is home in the fall of 1855 when two freedom seekers arrive, and he writes in one of the few letters in which he recounts this, this decision, the Underground Railroad works wonderfully. Two passengers arrived here last night. By the late 1850s, Tubman and Seward finally came into contact, likely through her efforts on the anti-slavery speaking circuit, common ground in their involvement in the Underground Railroad. In 1859, as already been said here today, uh, Ms. Tubman and the Seward family come to terms on a seven-acre farmstead. You're going to hear more about that today, I'm sure, from Reverend Carter. There were some reasons why perhaps it was uh, imprudent for Seward not to do this. In fact, one of Harriet Tubman's friends suggested that he had handed his political enemies a weapon with this decision because he is soon to be a major candidate for the presidency. Uh, he is suddenly taking some evasive maneuvers in Washington, striking a more, a more moderate tone, looking to uh, be electable. But still he makes this decision with his wife's support, his family's support, in fact, it's probably fair to say, his wife demanding that he do this. Uh, the land transaction that brings Harriet Tubman to Auburn, all the places she might have decided to settle when bringing her parents from St. Catharines, Canada. She chooses Auburn. Uh, and we think uh, she chose well to invest some degree of trust. She was making a dangerous choice, too. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 still presided over all that she did. Every move she made was, was, uh, was cloaked in danger. She made a uh, stunning, momentous series of choices uh, in the years that followed in the uh, spring of 1862. She returns to Auburn before going south to serve and fight in the war, bringing a young girl in tow named Margaret Stewart, uh, perhaps a niece of Miss Tubman's. A relationship has remained elusive to us, even with all the work we've done to try to suss it out. What is clear is that Tubman uh, loved this young woman dearly and entrusted her during her time in the South to the care of the Seward family. She lives with the family at 33, 33 South Street, 
Uh, I brought some brochures from the Seward House today. You can get all that information. My wife's got them right there. Um, come in, visit, and learn more. What I want to leave you with, without giving away all these great stories, uh, is some, some, some information about what that must have uh, been like. Margaret's uh, daughter, Alice, grew up, lived in Auburn, and uh, for a while, uh, recorded some of her memories of, of knowing her mother and Harriet Tubman. And she wrote once, I suppose, Tubman, thought of her white friends in the North and decided to place her dearest possession in their hands. Her dearest possession in the sewer. <coughs> I think we can see why a statue like the one we're going to see today is so important and so appropriate. I want to close with a quote uh, also, William Seward, a letter he writes in 1868 to a Major General David Hunter in the U.S. Army, trying to gain Harriet Tubman a pension, which he felt she deserved for all that she had done for her service to the Union Army. Harriet Tubman has been nursing our soldiers during nearly all the war. Of course, we know she did more than that. I have known her long, and a nobler, higher spirit, or truer, seldom dwells in the human form. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ludwig. And now to speak more about William Seward, Union College, and a couple of other entities also, Gustav Davis, MD, from Union College, class of 1959. I'm in an um, old alumni regalia for my 60th reunion this weekend. Hi, <laughs> um, So some 64 years ago, I uh, came up the Hudson River, turned right, uh, turned left at Albany, uh, came to uh, Schenectady, following uh, the tracks of William Stewart, who 100 and some years before, don't ask for the numbers, uh, took the coach to uh, Newburgh, took the Clinton's Folly up the river, and then the coach up the hill to Schenectady. Um, he was 15 years old. He was admitted to the sophomore class by a little if not, and it did pretty well. In those days, it was mostly debating and, and, and rote instruction. Uh, fell afoul of his father and a bill from a tailor decided to leave the college his senior year and go to uh, Georgia to teach at a Union Academy. His mother was upset, his sister was upset, they brought him back in approximately two months and he finished graduating a year later. He would have been the class of 1819, which would have made this his reunion class. But he took the year off. <laughs> As many students who have to be graduated. Um, the underground, two metaphors that I think are so fit, fitting, the underground railroad, below ground, and the overground, over, above ground map of the drinking board led uh, Harry Tubman from the eastern shore of Maryland up to Philadelphia, New York, Albany, and then west ending up in uh, Canada. The major, first major stop uh, along the road was Philadelphia, the home of a large Quaker community and rabid abolitionists, among whom was Lucinda, uh, Lucinda Mott. Lucinda Mott's sister, Martha, married David Wright in Auburn. And I'm trying to tell you, what is the Auburn connection? Because Auburn was off the main route to Canada, Rochester being the major city up there. And David Wright was Seward's law partner during the 18, I think it was 1844 trial of uh, a murder trial, uh, which was notorious because the defendant was a man of color, uh, was convicted and I died before he could uh, be executed. But the, the, the Mott sisters were part of a group in Auburn of Quakers, including of Francis Miller Stewart and his, her older sister, Lizette, who were really the, the conscience, I think, behind the Seward family and behind William in terms of his relationship to slavery. William Seward's credo, political credo, was the union, 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 abolition, and then later manifest destiny. 
He really believed that he had to solve the problems of one country and that slavery would go away. But if he focused on slavery, he was con concerned that the country would dissolve. This position didn't stand him well with the radical abolitionists, including his wife. It's likely, however, his stand on abolition, though not sufficiently radical, cost him the presidency. Because the Republican Party meeting in Chicago at the time was not interested in putting abolition first. Um, so there's the, the and uh, uh, Jeff talked about uh, Margaret Stewart, who was brought to um, Auburn by Harriet Tubman, and in fact was raised in the Seward House by Lizette and Francis, the sisters, while during this period of time, uh, William was in Washington, and he spent most of his time away from home. So that's some of the background. Uh, I would like to end my brief talk, if you'll put up with me, with a song we sang in uh, 1957, popularized by the Weavers. You remember? The Weavers and Pete Seeger. <laughs> Follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd. When the sun comes back and the first quail falls, follow the drinking gourd, for the old man is awaiting to carry you to freedom if you follow the drinking gourd. Thank you very much. who are here. Sarah May Pratt, who is the newest member of the Schenectady County Legislature. <laughs> and Closure, who's in the back, uh, Schenectady City Council. Harriet believed that they were achievable. 
when rescuing slaves to freedom, Harriet took giant steps with every challenge and succeeded by not tolerating failure, which was enforced, of course, by the pistol she was known to carry. <laughs> Harriet knew that if any slaves would retreat from the movement to freedom, her mission would be destroyed. Therefore, she would often tell the frightened slaves that on my Underground Railroad, I never ran a train off my track, and I never lost a passenger. Thank you. And, 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 and 
I, and her mother, they, some say that her mother told her after she had taken her to Canada that, that she needed a warmer climate to live in because Canada was a little too, little too cold for her. Well, Auburn is not much different. <laughs> Amen. So, so she was able to get her family down here. And because of that, Seward was able to make this arrangement for her and tell her to purchase this seven acres of prime property out on the outskirts of Auburn. And I do believe that it had not been for that connection, as Dr. Ludwig has said. If it had not been for that connection, we would not be sitting here today talking about these two extraordinary people who made a difference in lives on both the white and the black side, who were able to bring things together so that people realize that no matter where you come from, um, you can make a difference in the life. He was there to help her with seven acres of land. He was such, so good about it that he didn't ask for the money on the front. He didn't ask her to take out a mortgage. He made arrangements for her to pay it off. $25 down and $10 every quarter. That's a pretty good deal, don't you think so? <laughs> She is a woman who, after meeting William Seward, was always there. He talked about Margaret. Now, there's some, there's some other things about Margaret that I don't think he got into because he said they're still trying to do research. And yes, some have even said that Margaret may have been Harriet's only birth child. And there's a whole other story coming out about that later. But it, it, so, so for him to be able to, for her to be able to allow William Seward to raise a person who he, whether a niece or a child, meant that she trusted him. Among all other things, she trusted him with the most precious thing that she had at that particular point. We are here today though, because these two people came together, and they're coming together. They have brought us together so that we will understand that all people can join together and all people can work together. Harry is very well known as he talked about her, uh, Dr. Ludwig talked about her Civil War history. She was the only woman of any color to ever lead a troop of men into battle during the Civil War. And because of that, uh, she had made quite a difference in, in the world. So as we continue to come here today to lift up Seward and, and Harry Tubman, realize and remember that they were pioneers in their own right. They were able to cut a, a path where there was no path. They were able to bring people together when it seems as though the world was starting to pull apart with slavery and things of this sort. But because they were able to pull themselves together, they were able to make a difference in the community where they were. And that difference has continued to spread in our lives today. Harry Tubman was a caregiver before caregiving was a, a niche in life. And she would turn her property into a place to take care of those. And we thank William Seward because he had foresight to see that this woman had something on the inside of her that would make a difference in the community where she was living the community where he was living. And because those two were able to bring their lives together in such a real way, it made a difference in our world today. Harriet has to be the person who had could have, who is the only person who could have made this happen, happen. And because of that, we are here today. And so we thank you for coming here today and realize that these two people came together because there was a need. And because that need has been met, we need to realize what, what was said. We, we sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope where the present has brought us, facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. We thank you for all the seven minutes before noon and have six more speakers. <laughs> okay, Harriet Tubman and the Duryea Memorial AME Zion Short Church, Laura Lee from First Reformed Church of Schenectady and the Reverend Ruby Smith from AME Zion Church of Schenectady. here in Schenectady. Um, I'm standing here because the Reformed Church was the founding church of Schenectady, and we had a young man who was a member there in the early 1800s named Isaac Root Durier. Thanks to Marsha Mortimer. Marsha? Here, here. In essence, we are here today due to a lot that Marsha made happen. 
Um, she has put information about black history as connecting into the little booklet, and this is one place that you can find something in print. Maybe the only place so far uh, concerning Schenectady. And in doing that, she asked me to come and help her as a historian at the Reformed Church because our churches share an important part of Schenectady history. So what did Duryea do? Well, he was a young man committed to the anti-slavery movement. And he was born in Glenville, over here at the other side of Schenectady. Um, he was attracted to religion during a revival held here in 1832. And that revival sent him to the Reformed Church and he became a member there. He then went on to Union College, and as a student at Union, he was devoted to the abolitionist causes. Uh, he co-authored the Anti-Slavery Society at the college, and he co-founded the Anti-Slavery Society in the city of Schenectady. This was happening in the 1836 to 38. He served as president of the Union College Anti-Slavery Slavery Society. In addition to that, in his public agitation for the freedom of, of the enslaved, and the rights of African Americans. He was active with the Underground Railroad, helping many an escaping Negro from the Schenectady to the next stop, with the Negro laying flat under the hay in the back of the wagon. And I am quoting Duryea's granddaughter, who wrote that in memory for Union College to know something about their student Duryea. He decried the racism uh, that members of the community faced, writing that African American Schenectadians were represented as a mass of ignorant, slothful, miserable talkers, unable and unwilling to provide for themselves, and almost wholly incapable of moral and intellectual improvement. In contrast, Duryea said, of course, that's not true. Uh, the con he wrote of the contributions of Schenectady's African Americans and how much they did locally, financially, through their taxes to the public coffers, as well as in the works of the American, African American, and American temperance and mutual relief societies, and in organizing ably to create a school and a church. He noted that 13 of 39 former enslaved in this community had had to purchase their freedom, and in comparison to their efforts, he wrote, we may safely challenge the white community here to produce a like example of industry, perseverance, and generosity. This is over 100 years ago we are writing this. It goes on. I will save you at this point due to shortness of time. But he went on in this community to help them found the first black church of Schenectady, which was built right across the street from where today's the city hall is. After some folks didn't want it in another location, it's kind of ironic that it got placed right there on J Street. There's now a marker there uh, that marks the location of that first building. It was then moved, and uh, Reverend Ruby Smith, who's standing next to me here, will tell you something about the AME Zion Church today here in Schenectady, which Duryea helped the community found back there in 1837. Good morning to all of you. It is truly a pleasure, a privilege, honor, and also a joy to be a part of this legacy that means the mark of excellency of the vision of the Emeritus Frank Wicks of Union College professor and the multitude of supporters to erect a statue in honor of Harriet Tubman who is called the Moses of her people, and William Seward, an abolitionist of the Underground Railroad Movement. On behalf of the Duryea Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Church, we commend the team that endeavored to do this awesome task of the sculpture of Harriet Tubman and William Seward. We commend you for this magnificent achievement. I would like to just say on behalf of the African Methodist Church denomination, we continue to celebrate and commemorate the legacy of Harriet Tubman as was spoken in a pilgrimage form in Auburn, New York. And we do at each church of the Albany District in which we have presiding elder Alfonso Meadows Jr. and his wife Vivian Meadows here with us. We continue <laughs> to uh, inspire our youth to write a biography of Harriet 
and also to talk about why they would like to exemplify her model in their moral behavior and conduct. This is an annual thing that we do. I want to also lift up Marcia Monomore, who is a member of the Drury um, Church. Oh, I forget the name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Uh, she, as was spoken, wrote a pamphlet which was um, the early African American presence in the city and county of Schenectady. And she was also instrumental in uh, getting the Harriet Tubman way attached to the human street of Schenectady, New York where the edifice of the Dury Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church stands. I would like to just briefly say that the Dury Memorial African Methodist uh, Episcopal Zion Church did celebrate 180 years as a church anniversary. And we were so important. That was, of course, June 18th and 2017, but we were so embraced with many dignitaries from the uh, different categories of our uh, community. We had uh, civic, religious, political, and educational, corporate business, as well as family and friends. And some of the dignitaries uh, are here at this time. The theme of our church anniversary was we come this far by faith with scripture reference Hebrews 11.1. One. The Drury African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church extends to you a cordial worship and our fellowship services, followed by on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. located at 307 Hewlett Street, Harriet Tubman Way. And it's also noteworthy to say that Harriet Tubman home has become a national park. And it is called the Harriet Tubman National Park of Auburn, New York. But I want to just make one statement when I read the biography of the Reverend Isaac Gro Grote uh, Jurier. I was so touched when I saw that the inscription on his tombstone was that he was a friend of the colored race, quote, unquote, that really touched my heart. So to know that this giant would humble himself to have that inscribed on his tombstone. Thank you. Context, 
to encourage the recognition of local historic figures and the activities in which they engaged, to highlight the role of African-American abolitionists and freedom seekers, to preserve this history and to relate this history with us today. If you're interested in learning more about Underground Railroad History Project or the manner in which Underground Railroad History Project accomplishes these goals, there is a brochure uh, like this on the side table that you're welcome to take with you. I'm going to turn the microphone over to co-founder Paul Stewart. Thank you, Brandis. Um, so the Myers Residence, which is a one of the most conspicuous projects that we are doing, uh, the Stephen and Harriet Myers Residence in Albany, New York. Uh, it's a documented underground railroad site. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's a member of the National Park Service Network to Freedom. Uh, it's one of the um, 23, 28 sites of the New York State Underground Railroad Freedom Trail. And it's a member of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. It was the home of Stephen and Harriet Myers in the 1850s. Uh, they were leaders in the region in terms of the Underground Railroad. Um, the Myers uh, residence is, is now part of a, a larger set of properties, which we call the Myers Campus. And William Seward was one of the contributors to the work of Stephen Myers and Harriet Myers uh, when they uh, helped so many people in the 1850s. Um, and as identified by historian Kate Clifford Larson, um, Harriet Tubman uh, identified uh, Stephen Myers and Harriet Myers as the people to whom uh, she depended when she was coming through the region um, on her many trips. And so the Underground Railroad History Project is honored to be a collaborator in this project of creating and erecting a statue that honors the important role of Harriet Tubman and William Seward together in friendship. Um, as you know, uh, if there's still time, I guess, if you want to make additional contributions toward uh, the uh, statue, um, they can be made out, tag them, uh, Tubman uh, Seward statue, and um, for the Underground Railroad History Project. So we certainly are, are delighted and excited to, to have been asked to participate in this and glad that we could play that role and kind of move the ball down the court and uh, make this happen. So thanks very much. happening here today started with a vision and there were a number of visionaries involved I'd like to introduce three of them to come up and say a few words Frank Wicks, Twitty Stiles and Carl George
I took it. <laughs> <laughs> My lovely wife, Gail, no longer with us, uh, joined us. She was very important in emphasizing the important role of women at Union College. I could go on and on, but I will not. But when we did receive, we were almost immediately adopted by two magnificent people. Guess who they were? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Stiles and his magnificent wife, Connie Godson, Glasgow, outstanding pediatrician of our region, one of the most rewarded women in our whole area. In the process of our adoption, Professor Stiles and I established a group called Unitas at Union College, which was devoted to bringing all of us together. We asked our students, the some thousands of students that we had interacted with over our 62 years combined, to help. And so Unitas is a dynamic functioning group at Union. And as part of that group and that stimulus, we also came under the influence of a very wondrous person, Professor Frank Wicks. <laughs> and Frank has led us into a wondrous domain. I think one of the proudest things of my own life will be the unveiling of a statue, two statues, that we will eventually see. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, with that, I turn it over to a beloved companion, Frank Wicks. It uh, must be providence or something we, uh, maybe they don't believe in astrology, but what we have right here is all the superstars of the uh, area. So, and uh, the other thing, uh, what kept me going was a big idea three years ago, and uh, I, I started explaining the story and the theme, and, every, and I, uh, I heard uh, thousands of times I didn't know that. And it's, being able to talk to someone and hear them say, I didn't know that, is what kept me going. We had a statue to show people that didn't know it, now know it. Concept that uh, 
Harriet Tubman carried a pistol. Well, I didn't exactly want that to be prominent. <laughs> okay. But if you look at the, her tote bag, you'll notice the barrel of her pistol sticking out. <laughs> Yeah. 